I'm Joe Queer of the Infamous Queers, and you are watching Talking Records. First of all, uh, I wanted to ask you, how do you feel when the people call you a punk rock legend? The, those labels like this even mean anything to you? No. <laughs> to me, a legend's like the Ramones, you know. I, I guess legend, maybe, the only way we've earned it is because we've been around for so long. But like, you know, yeah, it, it's cool. It's fun, you know, playing. It's just part of the playing music. You know, punk rock. It's just goofing on ourselves and like getting on stage in front of people and acting like we're rock stars and stuff, but we're not. So, you know, uh, it, uh, you know, it, it's flattering, but I mean, I, you know, go home and my wife still makes me go out and, you know, give her all my money and makes me go to buy, you know, tampons for her and shit like that. You know what I mean? It's just like you keep your foot feeling around. Uh, but yeah, at the same time, it's, it's pretty, you know, it's fun. Well, I got to know the Ramones. And those guys didn't change just music, they changed the world. And all of them were really down to earth. I didn't know Tommy really, I didn't, Dee Dee, you know, I've met many times, but I, I didn't know him. Joey was the one I met the best. But anyway, I would see them backstage, certainly. And now I know CJ and Richie, and none of them have attitudes. And these guys were in legendary, a legendary band. Joey Ramon, as I read interviews with you, I see that he really inspired you in yeah. many areas, like he gave you a boost of confidence when you were starting, he gave you advices um, ab about uh, songwriting and this uh, great yeah. anecdote about uh, how long should a uh, supporting band play. Oh, that was a real big, that was, I never forgot that one, 22 minutes. <laughs> exactly 22 minutes. Yeah, he laughed, and it's funny because I recently saw one, Johnny Ramone's last interview and he says the same thing. He goes, let's face it, most bands only have one or two good songs anyway. Tw you know, fucking 22 minutes is all you want to watch a band. But we always had that attitude because when you're going out to shows, especially with the opening bands, you want to, like, I, I, many times I'd be at the Rat in Boston on a Friday night, and you want to see your friends, you know, you see your friends, you want to talk to them. You want to talk to chicks. You want to see the band, but you want to see them for 20, a half hour at the most. But these bands would play an hour, and you're like, please, stop. And it just sucks, and I never forgot that. So we play. If we could play shorter, we would. But I remember Joey saying that when you open up. At the time, we had never toured, but I remember him saying, the club owners appreciate it, the fans appreciate it, the sound guys, the stage crew. And it, you know, now it makes sense, but I never forgot that advice. See, we don't use a set list. So we play off the vibes. Yes, we kind of have a loose set list, but I can yell out this song and we'll go do 10 songs here, or I'll yell out this song and we'll go five there, and then come back to the what our, you know, our loose set list, and we feel off the crowd and the vibe. And a lot of bands, they just have a set set list, and they play it whether the crowd's into it or not. We have songs like, say, Mirage. We got this cool cover of Mirage we do. We're going to play it tonight. It only works once in a while. It won't work every night. But if you put it in the right spot, it's like a home run, man. But if you got it in the set and you play it every night, it, it's like, ah, uh, whatever. So you got to wait for that, and I'll turn around and go, And it's like it worked. We got a few songs like that, Janelle, Janelle. It can't be in the set, but if you yell them out at the right spot, it's killer, man. You get goosebumps. It's like, dude, it's great, you know. So uh, that's kind of how we approach it. Uh, we were friends. With, we're friends with Dusty Watson, who was drumming for Dick Dale. We opened up for Dick Dale years ago. That's when I met him, and he's played with us. Great, great surf drummer. And I saw Dick Dale didn't have a set list, and I said to Dusty, I recently saw him out in California about four months ago, and I said, dude, you know, you really influenced us, you, Ron, and, and Dick, and he goes, how so? I said, you didn't have a set list. Because I said, how do you do it? He goes, dude, I don't know if he's going to play Smoke on the Water or fucking Tiptoe Through the Tulips. 
He goes, I got to be ready. And he's like, they're right on. And I go, oh, I want to be a band like that. So we have our loose set list, but we start off like, like uh, instrumental lately. And then we do Tamara's a punk, like a parasite. And that's kind of like a sound check to, you know, get everything sounded. You know, for us, it's our sound check. And then we go maybe Deborah Jean, Murder in the Brady House, kind of. Uh, then we stop after that and we go into uh, Can't Stop Farting, which is a little more punky. So we build it up a little bit. So we start here and then we build up here. Then we end that and we go into No Tit, which was how we used to start our, our set. So then that brings up another little notch up there, No Tit. Then we go into that stuff from Love Songs for Retarded. Then I jump off stage, the long-haired guy, Ginger, he plays Wipeout or something like that, and then people are like, what the fuck's going on? Then we come in, and we do Love, 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 and Cindy's on methadone, and, you know, you build it up, build it up, and then, you know, we'll see where the set goes. So it's fun to do that, because we could play all sorts of different songs, Poppy or whatever. So that's how we build it up, build it up, build it up. I love it, because that uh, makes it uh, makes a set is like a living organism that is constantly in motion. Exactly. So you and you feel, it. and it may sound like a hippie, but we feel off the vibe of the crowd where they want to hear. They tell us where we're going. It sounds corny, but that's how we do it. And it really works good, because then you're putting on a show, and you're going, you can go this way, you can go this way. We could do instrumental, you know, whatever, and it's great to play like that. So, um, we're we're it, it took a lot of learning, but that was all from watching Dis Dusty and Ron and Dick Dale. Yep, no cellist, yeah. Awesome. Okay, I wanted to ask you about uh, Gigi Allen uh, because yep. um, we know how he is perceived by a mainstream, but uh, you also knew the other side of him, how he was uh, privately. Yeah. Um, can you can you tell something about him? When we first met him years ago, there would always be an ad in the paper, uh, Gigi Allen and the Jabbers want musicians. Gigi, every week, Gigi and the Jabbers. So we got to meet him, and I first met him, I was like, oh, I'd seen him, his brother played bass, Merle played bass in a really great band I love called The Thrills. Barb Kitson was a singer, Johnny Angel guitar, Merle was on bass, and I forget the drummer. They were a good band, they got two songs, Heartbreaker and Not Another Face in the Crowd, that were, I really love those songs to this day. The Thrills, look them up on YouTube. They got songs up, uh, Not Another Face in the Crowd and, and uh, Heartbreaker. But anyway, so we got to meet him and then he played drums and jammed with me on drums with this guy, Don, who passed away, a bass player. And he was quite a good drummer. But one thing when we met Gigi, I was never best friends with him, but I knew him quite well, was he loved the Ramones, but he also loved bubblegum stuff like the Turtles and the Monkees and Paul Revere and the Raiders, and he, he knew good music. Like, if you see on the cover of the first album, he's got that Brian Jones button, and, you know, the Stones, like, he loved the Stones. He was a great drummer, and he loved Keith Moon and The Who. He loved good music, and um, uh, so that was when I didn't really hang out with him when he got into the crazy, you know, drugs and acting crazy. I kind of, to be honest, me, I kind of felt bad for him. I thought he did all that just to get famous. He was going to do anything he could to get famous. Whereas he wrote some good songs, Drink, Fight, Fuck, all that stuff. It was pretty cool. But, um, you know, I knew him as a music aficionado. He's quite into it. Uh, my, he died at my friend Johnny Puke's house. And I said to Johnny up in New York City, I said, Johnny, what was going on? He goes, dude, we were just talking like this and no big deal. Just lay down, okay, I'm going to crash, I'll see you in the morning type thing, no big deal. And I went down and he just, his heart gave out. Because it was no big deal, like he wasn't shooting up and passed out. No, it wasn't like that at all. So, but he was a good guy, he's a good guy. We had the bass player, Don. So we lived about an hour away from Manchester, New Hampshire. We lived on the seacoast of New Hampshire, which was about an hour north of Boston. And Gigi was inland, Manchester, New Hampshire, about an hour. Anyway, I had a 65 AMC Rebel. And so we would go pick up Gigi, and then we'd drive down to Hampton, and I had the key to a restaurant I worked in during the, during the summer, but it was closed during the winter. But we'd sneak in there, I had the key to the back door I found, we'd go in there, the power was on but no heat, and we would practice there with Gigi. So we had a little cassette thing that we'd play tunes on on the way down, and I saw Gigi, so he was in the back seat, I was driving, my buddy Don, that Gigi was terrified of, Don was over here, the bass player, he was a good bass player. He died. But anyway, Gigi was playing, um, uh, he gave us a cassette tape and he said, oh, let me play a couple of the tunes by our, you know, my new songs we just recorded. 
So I was impressed back then that he had put out a 7-inch. It was like, wow, man, I really was impressed that he did it. I didn't like every song he did. Anyway, we played that song, Sherry Love Affair. Do you know Sherry Love Affair? It's a Gigi Allen song, Sherry Love Affair. It kind of sucks. Anyway, he's leaning over the, bat, the, you know, the seat, and he's like, we play this song. Don's drinking a beer sitting there. I'm driving. And he goes, what do you guys think? And, and Don's like, I never forget, he's like, let's face it, Gigi. That's what we call him, Gigi. Because let's face it, Gigi, that shit sucks. And Gigi was like really crushed, man. I remember he was bummed out. I was like, Don, again, I was impressed. I didn't expect to like every song, but it was like impressive that he was like doing this. You know, I really learned from Gigi. He put out a seven inch of shit. That's how I learned from, from him doing it. We put a seven inch out in 1981, and I because I learned from Gigi. That's how. And uh, so I th was very impressed back then that he did it, but I felt bad for Don. But that time, it was a couple times after that, this Don guy was really big, and he was a fucking redneck. Great bass player. Well, we're at this restaurant that's closed up. We're rehearsing. Don goes upstairs, and he starts drinking whiskey. You know, they had a bar that was closed. So he goes up there. We're practicing in the downstairs lounge. So he comes down, and he's like, oh, I want to play Leonard Skinner. So me and Gigi are like, ah, oh, we don't want to fucking play that shit. We want to play the Ramones and, you know, White Riot by the fucking Clash and shit like that. I want to play fucking Give Me Three Steps by Skinner. Play it or I'm going to kill you and all this shit. And so finally I calm him down. I get Dawn in the car. Gigi's over here in the front seat. Dawn was in the back seat. They were still at the restaurant. He jumps out, Dawn does, and he gets jumps up on the hood. And he's fucking, his feet are like this, he's got boots on, he's like, I'm gonna stick my fucking boot right through this fucking windshield. And I go, Don, get the fuck down, dude. Get down. And so, he jumps down, and it fucking, as God is my witness, he grabs the side view mirror of my 65 AMC Rebel. He grabs the fucking mirror like this. He didn't use two hands. He didn't wrestle with the thing. It was like in the movies. Grab the fucking mirror, rips it off the fucking car, my side view mirror, and throws it about a hundred fucking yards down the road. And Gigi's sitting there and he goes, let's get out of here. And so I was like, fuck this shit. So I fucking backed up and took off and Donna was throwing rocks at us and shit. And I stopped and I grabbed my mirror because I wanted the thing to put back on. And uh, I to this day don't know how he ripped the mirror off like that. It's like, uh, you know, you think you go like this or whatever. He just went, mm, boom, boom. And Gigi, I'll never forget that. Let's get out of here. He was terrified of Don, but he was a good guy. I like Gigi. We did a song called I Knew Gigi When He Was a Wimp that I told him I was going to write. And he got a kick out of it. He's like, oh, do it. And then I, we did it subsequently years later. But that song is true. I knew Gigi when he was a wimp. Sometimes we play it. When I think about uh, Gigi Allen and uh, also about your history, if today a person like, like Gigi Allen w would exist, then he would be eaten alive by, the, by this um, so-called social justice warriors. Yeah. And yeah. you had problems uh, yeah. also yeah. in they, your country, they, right? They hate us. They hate me now. Uh, oh, they call me the biggest racist in the world. Yeah. Nothing could be further from the truth. We fought Nazis all our fucking life. All of a sudden, I get called a Nazi. I'm racist. Like, what, what are you fucking talking about? But... It's people, I was talking to Ben Weasel about it, it's people that have never met us. They've never met us, and they take one thing and they want to twist it around. If you peel back the layers of the onion, you're like, why is this, this guy doesn't even know me, why is he calling me a, ra you know, a racist or he hates me? It's because if you peel back the layers of the onion and get to the real root of the whole thing, they're jealous. We get to fucking do it in our little bands, we get to travel around, and they're jealous. That's what it is. It has nothing to do with racism. But these guys are, you know, acting like they're on a higher level, you know, moral plane than us. And it's like, dude, you know, fuck you. It's, it's aggravating, but nothing could be further from the truth. And then we realized our fans, our true fans, if people who say this shit about us online, they're not our fans. We come, our shows have been great. They always, we always, we never meet any of these people. And I realized it's this online world 
where these guys don't have a life and, and they're really to be pitied. So, But having said that, it's pretty aggravating, pretty aggravating to get called a Nazi after you've been fighting fucking Nazis all your life. It's like, oh, dude, man, you weren't there when I got attacked because of our band name back in 93 or 92 or, or 97. Oh yeah, these guys would hate you. They fucking hate us. They hate us. These assholes. These fucking street punk assholes. They weren't. They hated us. They thought yeah. fucking homo and all that shit. They hated us. Yeah, yeah. And exactly. And it's always very uh, one-dimensional. People get offended so easily by absolutely anything. I personally, my take is, I don't think they're offended by it at all. It's just an excuse to fucking bitch. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody is is offended at all. So we just had some apparently transgender black teenagers up in Canada at one show and they're like blackballing our show they're boycotting our show and because they said our name was demeaning they didn't feel safe at the show that's what they said but none of them had ever been to a queer show but because they were black and they said they were transgender it was all over the news and everything and I was like going they've never been to a show I mean, in the old days, the old days, the media would not even listen to them. They'd say, well, why don't you go to a show and then tell us how you weren't, you know, didn't feel comfortable. You never even been to a queer show. How do you know how you'll feel? And we have a welcoming audience. You know, we would never sit around and watch anybody get in trouble at a show that we know about. No way. We'd stop. Of course we would. Any normal person would. But these people are acting like we're these... Oh, he's racist, homophobic, and all this stuff. I go, you, you don't even know me. But the media listened to them because they were black and they claimed they were transgender. I don't know. I don't even fucking know, but I was like, hey man, come to a show and then get back to me. But they, you know, it's just a bunch of bullshit. I blame the media. The media shouldn't even have talked to them. In the old days, they would have said, hey, come on. What do you mean you don't like something? It's like, you got a band and I say, I'm boycotting them. I don't feel safe. It's like ridiculous. Yeah. I don't even know who the fuck the, the band is. They've never been to a show. And besides that, our fucking audience is the nicest one out there. The Lookout audience, Green Day. Fucking they, we welcome everybody. We always have. We'd never, they were acting, implying like we are Nazis and we'd sit around watching our audience would berate them or something. No way we'd put up with that shit. No way. So the last question that I always like to ask, like for fun, if, if anything comes up uh, comes up to, uh, yeah. to mind, um, uh, what is your musical guilty pleasure? Something that your fans may be surprised that you like to listen to? Oh, you know, I listen to stuff because I've got a recording studio, so I listen to stuff. I don't, I still listen to Black Flag, uh, Screeching Weasel, the Ramones, of course, but Beach Boys and stuff like that. But I lately have gotten into i'll listen to stuff like i played trumpet in the band for about 14 years i played in the jazz band i played the dance band i was in the marching band and i i really learned how songs were put together and we were playing old stuff from the 40s string of pearls by glenn miller and all that shit tuxedo junction and so i listen to music now lately i've been listening to elo a lot of the stuff that was done on tape and it's really great production but songwriting-wise, I listen to a lot of songs from that angle, like, jeez, that's a great change. I wouldn't think of that. Because I've got a studio and I produce bands at my house. So I've got a studio, I, which I'm getting into more. I love doing that. I love producing. But I listen to, like, ELO lately, and it's like, I, I'm not, like, a huge fan, but I listen for the changes and, like, how they arrange the songs and, and parts and ideas. And I go, God, I never would have thought of that. That's great. Another band, CSS from uh, Brazil, if you know them, CSS, Love Fox. Uh, they were they lost their main guy, Adriano, and so they're not anything what they were. But they've got, it's like a really weird genre, like almost dance disco type. It's hard to, with a little punk rock in there. But I like listening to that. And then I listen to really, really, really old stuff like... Um, Al Bowley, Bowley, uh, some of his old stuff. He was an old crooner back from the 30s. Or uh, Billy Murray, I wonder who's kissing her now. I like listening to these songs, really old stuff from like 1910, 1915. 
uh, Jean Austin, she's funny that way, which is kind of a jazz standard now. Sinatra did that. Everybody's done that. She's funny that way. And how the songs I listen to, like, they're put together. And that's what I listen to a lot more lately. And so I think some of it might surprise people. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go get an ELO t tattoo, but I listen to stuff like off their Time album from, like, I think, 81. Very impressive what was done on tape. And I, I listen... I, it gives me ideas on changes and like, wow, I never would have thought of that. That's cool. And then it reminds me of when I play trumpet. And so uh, that's how would I listen to music now. Hi everyone, this is Marek from Talking Records. Thank you for watching my interview with Joe Queer from Legendary The Queers. If you liked it, don't forget to hit subscribe and check other interviews and reviews on my channel. See you next time.